Uh, well, thanks ever so much, Irma. It's an absolute pleasure for me to be back in New Zealand. Uh, uh, some of you know, I think, that I was born in New Zealand, in what's uh, euphemistically called the Deep South of New Zealand, in the Kaplan's uh, district on the southeast coast, uh, in the province of Otago. And uh, my background is uh, Naitahu and Scottish. Uh, and that means, it's, for me, it's a particular personal honor uh, to be the final keynote speaker at this really important conference. And, uh, before I get underway, I'd really like uh, everybody to be upstanding for Sioni and the organisers. It's been a marvellous event. So, yeah, there's uh, two reasons why it's a particular pleasure uh, for me to be here with you. So, that's the first one is that one, uh, my nighttime background. I uh, often look back on my childhood uh, in the 1960s. Uh, near the town of Owaka uh, in the Kaplans, and uh, I used on a sheep farm there, and my sage as a child was my great-grandmother, uh, a Naitahu woman uh, born in 1881 in, uh, in New Zealand. So that's a fair time ago. Uh, she lived to be 101. She, she lived from 1881 to 1982. So I think she knew a bit about health promotion. <laughs> Certainly uh, she knew how to live a good life. Uh, she died in her sleep at 101 years of age. And uh, we saw from uh, the presentations on the first day of this conference that uh, Maori people often have a much shorter life expectancy uh, than others in New Zealand. But she clearly had a much longer life expectancy than many others in New Zealand. So, so her principles of living, her way of living, uh, living in ways that are in <coughs> harmony with nature, understanding that we are all part of nature. Uh, nature is not over there. Uh, we are part of nature. That's a, a fundamental health promotion principle that we're yet to understand in organisations like IUHP. And hopefully from this meeting, uh, carefully uh, curated uh, by the Health Promotion Forum here in New Zealand. Hopefully that will be one of the takeaway messages. The second reason that I'm delighted to be with you today is that I'm one of the very few public health physicians in Australia that was trained in health promotion, not public health. So uh, my primary <coughs> public health qualification, apart from a PhD, uh, is a graduate diploma of health promotion from Curtin University in Western Australia. So let's give a hand for Curtin. So I was in the first cohort of uh, uh, the students to do the graduate of health promotion at Curtin. Uh, I commenced those studies as uh, a distance student when I was living and working in Northern Australia with Indigenous communities and uh, uh, Ross Sparks was um, leading that new program, quite an innovation at Curtin uh, in 1989. And it's really the, the things that I learned in that graduate diploma have really uh, uh, helped define uh, the career path I took, which is actually quite different, in fact, to many of my other public health physician colleagues. So with that personal background, I'd now like uh, uh, to walk you through some slides uh, I've titled my talk today, Planetary Health, Promoting Health in the Anthropocene. Because I think after this important conference, we really need to reflect on what needs to be different in our profession, in the profession of health promotion. What do we need to change uh, following what we've learned this week <coughs> uh, here in Rotorua? So I have got, um, uh, I'd like to do three things in the talk. First, I'd like to confirm that we all understand uh, the concept of the Anthropocene. Uh, Trevor Hancock spoke to this in his plenary, but I'd like to come back to that. I'd then like to talk about the Rockefeller Foundation Lancet Commission on Planetary Health, which I was honored to be part of. And the final thing is to address that question. Uh, what does all this mean for health promotion and for IUHPE? What does it mean for our work in health promotion? 
whether we work as educators, researchers, in health promotion policy, or in health promotion practice. So let's start with the Anthropocene. Uh, this new geological epoch uh, uh, named after us, uh, after the humans uh, on Earth. Uh, the epoch of the human. And uh, what I'd like to do now is show a three minute video. I'll ask the, uh, uh, for the lights to be turned down a bit. Uh, this is a short video that was shown at the opening of the Rio Plus 20 conference in uh, Brazil uh, in 2012. And I think it helps us ensure that we are all on the same page in these big challenges that we're confronting. So let's watch this together now. This is the story of how one species changed a planet. The latest chapter of our story begins in England 250 years ago. Fueled by coal, then oil, several brilliant inventions appeared. They ignited the Industrial Revolution, which spread like wildfire through Europe, North America, Japan, then elsewhere. The great railways, then cars and highways, connected people across the globe. <coughs> Medical discoveries saved millions of lives. New artificial fertilizers meant we could feed more people. Population rose rapidly. But this was nothing compared with what was to come. The 1950s marked the beginning of the Great Acceleration. Globalization, marketing, tourism, and huge investments helped fuel enormous growth. People swarmed to cities, which became even more powerful engines of creativity. In a single lifetime, the well-being of millions has improved beyond measure. Health, wealth, security, longevity, never have so many had so much. Yet one billion are malnourished. In a single lifetime, we have grown into a phenomenal global force. We move more sediment and rock annually than all natural processes, such as erosion and rivers. We manage three quarters of all land outside the ice sheets. Greenhouse gas levels this high have not been seen for over one million years. Temperatures are increasing. We have made a hole in the ozone layer. We are losing biodiversity. Many of the world's deltas are sinking due to damming, mining, and other causes. Sea level is rising. Ocean acidification is a real threat. We are altering Earth's natural cycles. We have entered the Anthropocene, a new geological epoch dominated by humanity. This relentless pressure on our planet risks unprecedented destabilization. But our creativity, energy, and industry offer hope. We have shaped our past. We are shaping our present. We can shape our future. You and I are part of this story. We are the first generation to realize this new responsibility. As the population grows to 9 billion, we must find a safe operating space for humanity, for the sake of future generations. Welcome to the Anthropocene. A link uh, to where you can download that film uh, for free from Vimeo is provided in that earlier slide. And I think it's, it's a useful place for discussion. I mean, uh, just as a little sidebar, um, uh, as Trevor pointed out, uh, our geoscience colleagues are arguing we're in a new epoch, uh, the Anthropocene, but some wags have said uh, that perhaps this really should be called the Anglocene, uh, the English-speaking epoch, because in many ways it's the English-speaking world uh, that is a core part uh, of the problem here in terms of ways of living uh, in, uh, in modern times. And, and I say that uh, uh, as somebody who works in this field, that uh, while it's, it's said in jest, uh, there's actually a kernel of truth in there uh, that those of us uh, uh, who occupy uh, the Anglophone world uh, need to reflect <coughs> carefully, I think.
So uh, the Lancet uh, Rockefeller Foundation Commission on Planetary Health uh, was an idea uh, uh, from Richard Horton, the editor of The Lancet. And uh, uh, notably here, uh, being in New Zealand today, uh, this uh, 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 public to planetary health manifesto uh, published in The Lancet in 2014. And if you look at the fine print there at the bottom, uh, of that uh, publication, you'll see that New Zealand uh, has a particular, uh, particularly important part to play in the evolution of these ideas uh, in the broader Lancet community. Uh, people like Robert Beaglehole, uh, Ruth Bonita, and uh, uh, John, uh, John Rayburn, who I, I haven't met yet, but I'm looking forward to, uh, to meeting at some stage. And uh, so uh, it, it's particularly relevant uh, to New Zealand uh, to be talking about this idea of planetary health uh, from the perspective of the Lancet. Uh, this is the title of the report of our commission, Safeguarding Human Health in the Anthropocene Epoch. Uh, you can see a list of the commissioners there. They're not all public health people. Uh, we came from a variety of different disciplines, including economics and environmental science, of course, and I was uh, honored to be part of it at the time I was directing the Global Health Institute at UN University. But uh, in essence, this report, which you can readily download from the website, is a, a review of what we know, a, a, a reasonably up-to-date review of the literature with a key set of recommendations as to how we might move forward as a health community. But you'll see in the bottom lines of uh, this slide that it very much builds on previous work, including the Brooklyn Commission and uh, the report, Our Common Future, uh, published 30 or so years ago, uh, notably led by uh, Dr. Brundtlen, who trained as a medical doctor in Norway uh, before she went on to chair that commission and to lead the World Health Organization. It also builds on the work of the IPCC on climate change and health, uh, the work of uh, the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment, which has been referred to several times in this meeting, uh, the One Health Approach, the Eco Health Movement, uh, the Convention on Biological Diversity's current work on health and biodiversity, including microbiological diversity, and notably uh, the very eminent uh, environmental epidemiologist uh, from this part of the world as well, uh, Tony McMichael who uh, warrants a particular shout out, I think, <coughs> talking about planetary health. Uh, Tony, who died in 2014, uh, wrote this prescient book, uh, Planetary Overload. Uh, in uh, 1993, it was published, more than 25 years ago. So uh, many of the ideas in our commission report uh, were developed in the context of Tony's work. But if we think back historically, uh, in my profession, the profession of medicine, this is a, an important figure, Hippocrates, uh, considered the father of modern medicine. <coughs> and more than 2,000 years ago, Hippocrates was talking to his patients. He was thinking about their circumstances from this ecological perspective and writing books like this on airs, waters, and places well before uh, we had modern scientific approaches. So we can deduce things through an ecological understanding, and we must remember that. Notably, of course, here at this particular conference, uh, we've all learned, and we've learned a, a lot, and I hope uh, many want to learn more about Maori understandings of health and well-being and broader indigenous understandings. Because while uh, planetary health is a new term in health policy and health research. It's not a new concept. Uh, for indigenous people all around the world, uh, these understandings of the connections between humans, uh, nature, and their human and their health are foundational in spiritual perceptions of the world and indeed contemporary cultural practices in many places. So let's make sure we take that away as part of the legacy of this important meeting. So what were our findings from the Commission report? I, I've only got 10 minutes or so left, so I'm gonna skip through some of that. Um, we found that by almost any measure, the human population is healthier now than ever before. 
Uh, so you look at uh, World Bank data from 1960 here through <coughs> 2010, and you can see the black line in the middle there, uh, world average life expectancy on this upward trajectory during this phase from uh, the low 50s uh, to the, into the high 60s. You can clearly see uh, the uh, continuing disgraceful health inequity in Africa and South Central and West Asia. But we are moving upwards on health. In achieving those health gains, though, we've exploited the planet at an unprecedented rate. Carbon dioxide emissions, as you saw in that film, ocean acidification, energy use, global deforestation, water use, fertilizer use. <coughs> this goes on. And Trevor Hancock referred to planetary boundaries, a concept coming from environmental science, uh, arguing that we're beginning to exceed the boundaries of a safe operating space for humanity on Earth. So what is planetary health? Put simply, planetary health is the health of human civilization and the state of the natural systems on which it depends. Notably though, <coughs> planetary health is a social justice issue. So Fran Bohm was one of the opening speakers in this symposium and Fran would understand planetary health through this lens, through this lens of social justice. Very important. And indeed, you've probably seen these scaled cartograms in some of the presentations at the conference. A scaled map of the world uh, showing mortality impacts from climate change that are already happening on Earth. Are scaled according to WHO regions. And you can see that when we look at who's already dying from climate change, it's Sub-Saharan Africa and South Asia. <coughs> and who's responsible? And this is the companion slide, the disgraceful companion slide, cumulative emissions of greenhouse gas emissions. Who's responsible? You can see uh, it's the United States, uh, United Kingdom, countries in Europe, uh, Japan, countries that had major industrial revolutions have the historical responsibility, but as an Australian, uh, our per capita carbon dioxide footprint is now among the highest on Earth. And so unless we see changes in our country, we will become <coughs> uh, an even bigger part uh, of, of the future problem. Now, on the whole, this can be a pretty depressing story, and we were careful in the Commission report to balance that with the opportunities. The opportunities for co-benefits from transitions to sustainable ways of living. Co-benefits for the health of people and for natural systems more generally, including, as Patrick just pointed out, the great value of increasing access to modern family planning. With more than 200 million women wanting to avoid pregnancy, but not using effective contraception. Providing access to family planning could cut maternal deaths by about 30%. And meeting those needs for modern contraception in low-income countries wouldn't cost very much at all. Uh, only about $5 million per year. It's not a matter of money, it's a matter of political will. And our broader economy, our highly consumptive economies in countries like Australia and elsewhere, uh, high-income countries in particular. We need to transition uh, from that wasteful economic approach to a circular economy where we're focusing on reuse, repair, recycling, and in fact, perhaps not using the word waste anymore because every <coughs> material is a resource. The byproduct of one process can be a resource and an input into another. Our key findings were uh, solutions lie within reach and require a redefinition of prosperity to focus on quality of life and improved health for all, together with respect for the integrity of natural systems. You can see how aligned this is with Maori understandings of the world. There were three broad categories of recommendations at conceptual challenges that we face. We might call these phase of imagination, our failures to imagine better ways to measure progress rather than relying on the lazy approach with GDP, bringing in measures of human development and the state of the environment. Governance challenges, phase of implementation, if you like, uh, the need for us uh, to set sight 
uh, for a vision for the world <coughs> and future generations. As uh, it's delightful to learn here in Rotorua that New Zealand is doing. And there are other shoots around the world. Indeed, uh, in Wales, where in 2015 they passed the first legislation for the well-being of future generations. And they're thinking across whole of government about these issues. And then for the researchers in the room uh, and the, the educators, the research and information challenges, the failures of our current knowledge systems. Uh, we need a, a much more uh, transdisciplinary approach, an approach that values not only the academic disciplines, but the know-how from indigenous ways of understanding the world and from people in policy and practice. Uh, that's expertise too, and we need to bring it into the decision making. Here's a link. Uh, to the Commission report. There are a number uh, of other materials on that site, and including an interview uh, with another uh, New Zealander, Helen Clark, who at the time we were uh, working on the Commission was based in New York with UNDP. And that's a reminder that as we were doing that work uh, in 2014 and publishing in 2015, it was the same time that many of us were working with the UN system to develop these 17 Sustainable Development Goals. This is an enormous opportunity for us and for health promotion. How do we change the way we work in the context of these sustainable development goals? And as an infographic, <coughs> uh, this one from WHO, I think is very useful because it shows that uh, for our work in health promotion, we need to understand uh, that health is an outcome of sustainable development and that all of those SDGs are relevant to human health and well-being in different ways. And indeed, UNDP understands that because they published recently this issue brief on planetary health as an integrative way of approaching the implementation of the SDGs, uh, weaving together our approaches to development rather than being in 17 silos, which is a big risk when you've got that laundry list of goals. We need to have integrative ways of, of, uh, of, of achieving change. So as I begin to wrap things up, uh, I wanted to offer a reflection uh, following these four days, and I think this is one of my key messages, that human ecology is a really important way of understanding patterns of human health. And we need to bring this, uh, this way of understanding alongside epidemiology as a core method in health promotion. Historically, certainly in recent decades, epidemiology has been privileged as the way of understanding health. I think we've learned at this concert, conference that we need more ecological ways of understanding. And uh, that's just not the classic <coughs> social ecology, that's a broader uh, human ecology with a strong focus on natural systems that aligns very well uh, with indigenous understandings. And for me, I found the writing of Stephen Boyden, uh, including this book, a short book, well written, uh, only a couple of hundred pages, very clear, it's not dense and hard to understand. And it's called The Biology of Civilization, Understanding Human Culture as a Force in Nature. When you say those words, that's the Anthropocene. That's what he's talking about. We're now a force in nature. And I just want to uh, show a few quick slides that tell a bit of a story of the way that human ecologists think about health. So in human ecology, we understand that all human activities, whether they're individual things we're doing, so-called behaviours often in health promotion, or whether they're collective things that we're doing as societies, have the potential for positive or negative impacts on health. And this includes an understanding of the social determinants of health, because the tax system we put in place fundamentally is a human activity. It's something that we have agreed to do together collectively. This is at the core of health promotion understandings. Importantly though, human ecology enables us to understand, if we look from another lens, that those same human activities, whether individual or collective, are affecting the health of the planet in different ways, including the stability of the climate system. And notably, as we've learnt in this conference, there are health impacts from those changes to the planet at the same time. 
So there are two pathways between human activities and health. There's the classical pathway that we tend to focus on, but then there's this other pathway which Trevor Hancock calls the ecological determinants of health. So this is about bringing the, the, the social and the ecological together and importantly, uh, remembering that this is a system. Uh, in human ecology, we talk about systems thinking and there will be feedbacks and unintended consequences in the system and we need to understand that because as health promotion practitioners, we can cause problems from the work we do, unintended problems. So have a look at Stephen Boyden's work. He calls this the biosensitivity triangle. You, there's, a, there's a book link there. You can download that for free um, from the ANU website. So I, I can see the time's up, but I've got two more slides. Uh, this is uh, an infographic that we're now using in the program I direct at uh, uh, the University of Sydney. We call it the Planetary Health Platform. And we understand planetary health as being about a cultural transformation. Planetary health is about safeguarding the health and well-being of current and future generations through good stewardship of Earth's natural systems and by rethinking the way we feed, move, house, power and care for the world. You can see Stephen Boyden's uh, triangle there at the top, uh, the things we do, those human activities with the range of implications for the health of people and the health of natural systems but you can see as we go down through the schema, how do we manage the things we're doing? How do we change those things, whether as individuals or collectively? How do we manage ourselves to leave no one behind in the language of the SDGs? And by this, I don't just mean people we can see in the world. I mean, let's not leave future generations behind. Indigenous cultures want to think seven or ten generations ahead. And Importantly, you can see they're in yellow. What do we value? What do we learn about in our education systems? How do we regulate human behavior? What laws and policies are we putting in place? What economic system are we using? And then at the bottom, to make this tractable and real for people, uh, we've identified five big pathways. <coughs> how we feed the world, how we move the world, how we house the world, how we power the world, and importantly also how we care for the world whether that's in formal healthcare systems or whether we're caring for the earth. And again, you can see that bottom line. Our future depends on the health of the natural world. We can't say it often enough. We need to bring it in to the daily work of health promoters. So this is my final slide. What does all this mean for our profession? Uh, how do we promote health in this Anthropocene? And importantly, how should we, RUHPE, respond? How do we need to change? Firstly, uh, we need to bring this perspective on intergenerational health equity into our daily work, no matter what we do in health promotion, because we want to leave no one behind, including future generations, the legacy of our work. Secondly, we, and in fact, that intergenerational approach is very clear in the SDGs. And so, as we engage with them as a profession, uh, between now and 2030, this is a really good engagement point. We've been working hard on health equity, but we haven't been doing enough on intergenerational health equity. Secondly, an eco-social approach, as I said before. And by that, I mean an approach that recognises the ecological, economic and social foundations of health. And to complement the biomedical approach, but we can't just have the social determinants, we need this broader, integrative approach that brings in, number three, indigenous <coughs> understandings and local knowledge. Because uh, this number three actually already does number one and number two. And we've learned that, it's been reinforced this week. And so a couple of final sentences. In sum, I think we need to bring a planetary consciousness to health promotion, education, research, policy and practice. We all need to be thinking about natural systems, no matter where and how we work. And uh, perhaps to come back to some of the historical references yesterday, uh, a full enlightenment, ideally. Uh, we heard a bit about uh, some of the ideas in the, in the Northern Hemisphere in the 17th, 18th century. The so-called enlightenment, uh, the, 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 uh, 
enlightenment, the time of reason, bringing science in. But if you look at that and scrutinize it, as was done yesterday, it, it's not an ecological understanding. It's not based on an understanding of natural systems. So uh, can health promoters be part of achieving a full enlightenment uh, in the world? And uh, bringing the Southern Hemisphere into those conversations as well. Kia ora. Kia ora.